Hey, we have some music, more music coming for you with oboe and piano that is going to warm your heart, which will feel good today. As a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs for you. Or honestly, as we long to go indoors and get warm, so our soul longs for you. And I was thinking about that. That's a legitimate parallel. Because on a day like today, not only do we want to be warm, we need to be warm. Or literally, life ends. And may we seek God that way today. Let's worship as we hear. Let's jump in right in the last four verses that Pastor Troy preached last week. This is the end of Revelation 7. Those four verses say, say this, and these verses will shape the songs that we sing today. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. And you know what? The great tribulation, the seven years of tribulation is still to come. But some people even here, even within the sound of my voice, are going through it. They're not going through the great tribulation, but a great tribulation. And notice the ones coming out of that 
Look what God does and what, how they respond. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Why is it phrased that way? Because they knew hunger. They knew the striving of thirsting. The sun shall not strike them, nor shall any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. This is the shape of our songs. The lamb will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Could we pray together? Lord, just like those going through the great tribulation knew hunger and thirst, Lord, we here know what it is like to have tears in our eyes. And our theology is is weak and messed up if we think if we truly serve a great and a good God, we will never have tears. He has told us time and time and time and time again, we will have tears because in this world we will have tribulation. It's just for followers of Jesus, we never experience it alone. So, God, we don't even want to experience the next hour of worship through song and scripture alone. So we pray that you, the great Jehovah that led Israel through the wilderness in Exodus, Lord, that you would lead us through, that our hearts would truly worship, that our our souls would feast on the God that we hunger for and can be satisfied by. And Lord, we pray that you would be our shepherd such that we would not sing or live in want. We pray that we would realize the fact that you lead us, make the terrain of wherever we are look secondary to the primary thing. It's who we're with. So God, I pray by your grace we would experience you that powerfully and personally today, wherever we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand? We call on God to lead us, even this morning. Will you sing it?
shepherd leaves. be seated. Our Savior, who is the shepherd of our souls, shows his love for us by not only loving us still, but by leading us still. Could we do this? I invite each of you to read out loud with me Psalm 23, and we'll read this together from the classic King James Version. Will you read it? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
one who led us through life will lead us through death. Sing this. centuries, hymn writers, poets, Christians have, have used biblical language like, by his hand he leadeth me, even though it's not a physical hand. It's, it's not a touch that I feel physically, but he so reaches himself out to us in a real way that we experience his guidance, his leadership, not through a cloud or through a fire, but truly by His Spirit and through His Word. And He leads us. And what I love about that hymn is He leads us all the way through life, through death, and into eternal life where He will lead us and we will see Him like never before. Listen, as Phil Kitchen and Karen Bjorland lead us in this song.
you know what we might say when the Savior wipes the tears from our eyes? He touched me. He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now I know by experience He touched me and made me whole. Would you stand together as we sing that? faces across this room and there's something behind that thank you you didn't mainly sing thank you Lord because I put it on the screen you, you sang it because he saved your soul he, he touched your life he reached down to a place where you couldn't reach out to him and he touched you in a deep place and it was a healing touch not a condemning push And we respond saying, thank you, Lord. Experiencing a thank you in a totally different way because we've experienced God as the Savior and shepherd of our souls. So I wonder if we could sing thank you, Lord, one more time. But this time, all the instrumentalists, they'll just sing with their voices. And let's just fill up this room, maybe even your living rooms, with the sound of thanksgiving. Sing it.
us to freely give you thanks as you have freely given us salvation. Lord, we come to hear your word. Continue to impact us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, good morning. Happy 2024. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I'm glad you're here. Uh, thanks for coming out in the weather. For those of you at EMP and those of us at Ch- those of you at Chaska and our chapel service, thanks for braving the weather. And for those of you that are smart, uh, welcome online. Good place to be today while it's cold here today. I'm excited to get into our passage today. We're continuing in our study in the book of Revelation. And we're going to make our way through chapter 8 today. So if you have your Bible with you or a digital device, you can make your way over to chapter 8. Today marks, if my math is correct, today marks 16 weeks into this amazing, but at times for me, a little bit overwhelming, and yet majestic book of Revelation. So if you've missed some of these messages along the way, I would encourage you to take the time and catch up. Each week kind of builds upon the previous week, and it really helps you to rightly understand any given passage when you're able to take it in the context of the whole narrative. So, of course, those are available on our website uh, or on our app. And if you're new to Grace, if you're jumping in kind of mid-series, or maybe it's your very first time with us, today's going to be great. There is a wild passage, a lot going on, but my, my hope is, my prayer is, by the end, we'll have some clarity around what God might be saying and, and how we would act upon that. So, Gracers, if you brought a friend today, just hold their hand the whole time. And we're going to be okay. We're going to make our way through this passage. So as we dive into this passage, I have a confession for you. Um, Over the years, I've taken a couple classes here and there on Revelation or the Millennium or End Times. And and yet, in studying this passage more deeply these last few weeks, it's kind of messed with me in a good way. I've found it kind of profoundly messing with my soul. And I've, I've then been praying like, okay, God, maybe you would work in other people's souls in this way too. So here's a few things that have been bouncing around my soul as I've been preparing. First is this, I've been surprised by the beautiful portrayal of our just and holy God. Like without question, God is loving and kind and merciful and, ge- and generous and gracious, but he's also a God of justice and he is holy as we were just singing. And in this passage and throughout Revelation, I think there's a glimpse into his holiness and his justice in a really special way. I've also been overwhelmed by the intensity, and today's passage is intense, that's going to play out in the tribulation. A lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And lastly, I've been impacted by the seriousness and the sobriety that I think this passage demands of its readers. Uh, If you know me at all, I'm a pretty fun-loving, sarcastic, goofy guy, and this passage has caused me to kind of like, whoa, there's some weight behind the intensity of this passage, and so it's kind of marked me in a way. I also feel like so much of what we study in the Scripture, in a good way, is about the past and what has happened. And yet most of Revelation is about what is yet to come. And therefore, I think it puts a certain burden on us or a certain expectation upon us that we're reminded that we live in this time and in this day by God's design. And we are here to make an impact together with God for his glory across the street and around the world. And the impact that we make today does play out into the future. So as we study what will come in the future, there's a sense of ownership that I think we should take moving forward. So be lovingly forewarned. I've been praying that God will, in the best way, mess with you today as well. That somehow the intensity of the book of Revelation will inspire you to take steps to walk closer to God, to take steps to walk in the path that God has for you. So with that, let's jump into chapter eight. Let me give you some context, and then we'll read the passage together. So the scroll and the seven seals, first introduced back in Revelation 5. And then in chapter 6, the first six seals are open, and we did that in two messages. Last week, then, chapter 7, Pastor Troy led us through. We saw a glimpse into heaven. We saw the 144,000, what seems to be ethnic Jews who have given their life to Christ, and now a radical, in the best way, evangelist reaching people in the midst of the tribulation. It's glorious. That leads us to today in chapter 8. So if you're able to do so, I'd love for you to stand with us as we read God's word in honor of God's word. Chapter 8 of Revelation, verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in the heaven for about a half an hour. 
And then I saw seven angels who stood before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense from the altar to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke from the incense and the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow. Verse 7, the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. A third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of that star was Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood as many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise, a third of the night. Verse 13, then John says, I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. You may be seated. This is a lot. This is an exciting way to get into a new year. So let's walk our way through this passage. So again, chapter seven ends. We see a countless multitude along with the angels, worshiping God. It's specific in the text to say that they're worshiping and declaring his holiness and his beauty very loudly. That's in the text. So as John kind of gives us this insight into what's happening in heaven, on earth, things are still going bonkers. Wars are taking place. Cries of fear are coming from every nation and every corner of the planet. Humanity is petrified. Conflict and chaos reigns. And then we zoom down from, in chapter 8 today, from the heavens in chapter 7 into chapter 8. As the seventh seal is about to be opened, there's a silence, John says, for about a half an hour. And it's fascinating to me, this word silence in this way is only used once in the entire book of Revelation, which means it really does stand out and it's a big deal. One commentator put it this way. The implication is that when the judgment is about to happen becomes visible as the seventh seal is broken and the scrolls unrolled, both the redeemed and the angels are reduced to silence in anticipation of the grim reality of destruction they see written in the scroll. The half-hour silence is the calm before the storm. And in in in, in this silence, it's foreboding. There's intense expectation and awe of what God is about to do. So loud worship with countless multitudes and angels in the heavens. And then in the heavens, just like that, dead silence. That's only 10 seconds. And this goes on for a full half hour or so, John says. The stark contrast, this anticipation of this judgment that's about to be released. So the silence is then interrupted or disrupted by the seven angels being given the seven trumpets. Now, it's not entirely clear who all these seven angels are. It could be that one of them is Gabriel, who we know of from the book of Luke and also in the book of Daniel. Could be another is Michael, noted in the book of Daniel. And later in Revelation chapter 12, I could not find any other biblical references to the other five angels. Regardless of who the angels are, these seven angels are given the privilege of sounding the seven mighty trumpets, and they signal an unleashing of a series of unprecedented physical judgments on earth. Then, just before, verse 3 and 4, before these trumpets are heralded, an angel comes on the scene and stands at the altar and comes on the scene with a golden censer. 
It seems likely to me that this angel is Jesus himself, though it, he may not be. This might be an angel. There's, theologians have different ideas on who this could be. One theologian put it this way, that the angel is higher than even the archangels is evident from his function. He transmits the prayers of the saints to God on the throne. Here we see his gracious ministry, that is Jesus, of intercession, conveying our prayers to the Father. So this angel then is given much incense and it's mixed together with the prayers of the saints and it is offered up to God in worship there at the throne. So here we have this moment of beauty, this timely moment and a reminder that Jesus, because he is the one and perfect sacrifice for our sins forever, therefore our daily praise and intercession are acceptable to a holy God. And in the hand of this great high priest are held the cries of our confessions, of our petitions. And God hears them and he receives them and he answers them because of what Christ has done. Because of his death and resurrection on our behalf, and we didn't deserve it and we don't deserve it now, our holy God hears our prayers. Verse 5, then the angel takes this censer and mixes it with fire from the altar and throws it down on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashings of light and an earthquake. Fire throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament commonly refers to God's judgment. Matthew 3 and Luke 12 speak pretty clearly of this as well. One theologian put it this way, here we see an explicit connection between the petitions of the saints and the resulting judgment. This all occurs in answer to the prayers of the saints. All things will not be resolved on earth until judgment comes. Our God is a God of justice. And then the first trumpet heralds. Verse 7. After that followed hail, fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all the grass was burned up. So the inhabitants of earth at this time had already experienced lots of storms and earthquakes and all kinds of craziness. And now it's getting even it's getting to be a big deal. It's becoming overwhelming. We see hail coming down along with objects of fire mixed with blood. It's not entirely clear what, what is meant by mixed with blood. Is it that blood was coming down along with the hail and the fire? Certainly possible. Is it, is it that the hail maybe looked red because it was coming down together with the fire? Also possible. We don't know, but we do know it's devastating and it's horrifying. This bombardment leaves a third of the earth scorched, a third of the trees burned, and all the grass destroyed. Interestingly, pretty similar to the fifth plague noted in Exodus chapter 9 when God is bringing judgment upon Pharaoh and his people, demanding that he set the Israelites free. So this first event, this first judgment at the blowing of the first trumpet, is verging in and of itself of catastrophic. Much of the food for the animals is now wiped out. Their habitats decimated. Mankind's habitats decimated. Fire is likely breaking out all over the place. Crops are destroyed. The situation is becoming more and more untenable. And then the second trumpet. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures of the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. It's fascinating to me. John here, struggling with words perhaps, he sees something. It says it looks like a mountain. It's not a mountain. He wasn't sure what it was, but he's trying to describe it. Some think it could be a meteorite or an asteroid. Others think it could be a massive volcanic explosion. I would probably generally lean towards, though I have... I'm not, it hasn't happened yet, I'm not there, probably lean towards a meteorite of sorts. But the bottom line is, a third of the sea becomes blood, resulting in a third of the sea life dying, along with a third of the ships. Well, it makes sense that a third of the sea life would die, because I would assume sea life doesn't do well in blood. The ships, what's this about? Again, no one really knows. I would venture to guess it's some, maybe tsunamis. Between this massive mountain-like object coming into the ocean, between the earthquakes that we've already heard of, there would be tsunamis. This would devastate shorelines, devastate ships at sea. It's possible. Before you can catch a breath, the third trumpet. And a, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and a third of the spring water. And the name of this star was Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died, it says, from the water because it had been made bitter. So another catastrophe. 
from the sky, and it contaminates a third of the water. I think the idea here, some translations use the word springs, some use the words wells. I think the idea is that the fresh water, the drinkable water, whether above ground or below ground, a third of it has been contaminated, poisoned. It's lethal. Wormwood is this deadly ingredient referred to off and on a couple times in the Old and the New Testament. I believe it goes back to the root word of absinthe, some kind of a poison. The the exact nature is unknown, but it would kill you. And of course, then a third of the fresh water in the world is poisonous. Many people die. And I would assume many animals die too because they're drinking the same fresh water. Then the fourth trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, likewise a third of the night. Now, it's possible that this means that the actual brightness, if you will, is diminished by a third, entirely possible. I tend to think that perhaps maybe in addition to that, what happens is a third of the day and a third of the night are plunged into utter darkness. Maybe Jesus is referring to this in Matthew chapter 24 when he says the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Well, people way smarter than me, solar physicists, natural sci- uh, scientific naturalists, climatologists, theologians, they all have a bunch of wild and wacky ideas about what could happen and how this might happen. I have absolutely no idea, but I do know this. The Bible says it will happen. And this does seem reasonable. It does seem reasonable to me to assume a few things. That this event will dramatically alter the temperatures around the globe. It will decimate all normality for all living beings. This drastic change in temperature and light would trigger global storms like we've never seen. It would mess with oceanic tides like we've never seen. And unleash another entire realm of terror on those on the planet. And with that, the judgments end in chapter 8. Happy New Year. It's good. It's a lot. So let's, let's, let me review this quickly because there's a lot going on. So first we have hail, fire, blood. A third of the tree's gone, all the grass gone. We have a mountain-like object coming in from the sky. A third of the sea, blood. A third of the sea, living, living things dead along with a third of the ships. A star comes in from the sky. A third of all drinkable water contaminated. Then the sun, the moon, the stars are struck. And the lighting... And the heating of the planet is thrown completely out of whack. Any one of these things is petrifying, scary, and mortifying. When you have them back to back to back to back to back, that's intense, very intense. One commentator put it this way, these four trumpets reveal the severity of God's judgment. He attacks all the ordinary means of subsistence, such as food and water. He attacks all the ordinary means of comfort, such as light and the regular rhythm of days. After then, these four judgments come, one after the next after the next. John says in verse 13, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying out with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets of the other three angels are about to blow. Now, there's differing interpretations on whether this was an eagle or whether it was an angel. King James Version and a few other versions translated as angel. ESV, NIV, and some others translated as eagle. Personally, I probably lean towards some kind of an eagle figure. However, regardless of the form of the being, the real issue is the warning. That's what's critical. So at least two things about this warning. And the first one is very important. This warning makes it clear to all mankind that this series of catastrophes is not due to Mother Nature, quote-unquote. It's not a series of natural disasters compounding upon one another. Rather, these devastations are coming from God himself, from the very hand of God. His judgment is being poured out upon the earth, and no one's going to be able to deny that. I think that's a really big deal. It's one thing to write off these storms as natural disasters. It's another thing to say, oh, my goodness, God, holy God, righteous God, creator God, is releasing judgment upon us. The second, of course, warning from this eagle figure is it's going to get a lot worse. And that'll be next week in chapter 9. So with that then, chapter chapter 8 ends just before three more trumpets. How about we take a deep breath? That's a lot. Good deep breath there, young man. 
So, so what is God saying to us through this passage? How, would we, how do we interpret this? What, what might God be saying to us through it? And, and how might God be challenging us to respond to his word? I have three things, not only for your consideration, certainly you should consider them, but hopefully for your application. The first is this, be prayerful. Press into prayer. Your prayers and the prayers of his church matter more than we can understand. Our prayers are used by God to impact world events and generations. Now look, I'm 50 years old now, and I like being 50. When you're 50, people think you're old and all the expectations go down. It's amazing. <laughs> I grew up a missionary kid. I gave my life to Christ in high school. I jumped into ministry at 19 years old, spent six years overseas with missions, 13 years pastoring another church here in Eden Prairie, six and a half of that as a senior pastor. I've been here at Grace now for 10 years. I've seen a lot of church stuff. I've seen a lot of Christian stuff. And I would suggest this. I think we all know that prayer is a big deal. I don't think we live like prayer is a big deal. Not when you put it in the scope and scale that we see here in this book. As trippy as it seems, our prayers transcend the physical realm and enter a spiritual realm. Our prayers are never forgotten by God. Think about that. God is never once and never will forget any one prayer you prayed to him. And he uses your prayers and they impact and they, they, they play out over history past and history to come. But do we actually pray like that? Do we actually pray like that, that there is real power, generational power, national, international impact based on our prayers, based on what God does. So how about in 2024, all of us take some steps forward in our prayer life. I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a great prayer. I'm a great doer. Couple things. Let's be a church that prays often because it's actually usually the greatest thing that we can do rather than the least thing that we can do. Sometimes we get in this mindset for you doers, well, I don't know what else to do, so I guess I'll pray. Okay, that kind of undermines prayer. If you don't know what to do, whether you do know what to do, always pray. Let's be a church that prays with a sense of conviction and passion because we know of God's power, we know of his great love for his church, and we know of his love for the lost. I find ourselves in the West here, there's these measly, meager faith prayers, things like this, you'll hear this a lot, I don't know really what to do. I'm just going to throw a couple prayers up to the big guy upstairs. What can it hurt? That's not prayer with faith to a holy, powerful, and magnificent God. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, maybe we just all give ourselves to praying a little more and praying consistently. Maybe we can finally let go of the excuse that I'm just too busy to pray. Or worse yet, that I'm just honestly, if I'm honest about it, I don't pray because I'm distracted or I'm indifferent. So be prayerful. I think it's a clean takeaway from this passage. Be prayerful because your prayers have a generational and global impact. They can when God uses them. Maybe we let the intensity of this passage drive us to intercession. Second, be warned. Why don't we be wise? I'm stubborn headed and I am a rebellious person to the core. Ask my parents. Let's respond to his warnings. Let this sink into your soul. The warnings of God are loving and merciful. In his kindness, he warns us. He doesn't warn us to like sour our lives. He warns us to protect us from the danger that comes with sin and disobedience. I try to imagine what it would be like on the planet as these four judgments are playing out on top of the other catastrophes that have been unleashed by God. And I would say even the doomsday preppers prepper isn't gonna survive this. Now, we have some preppers in and around that are at grace. I know who you are because you're the house that I'm going to if something crazy happens. Now, how far you take prepping is a whole nother issue, but of course it's wise to have a measure of provision, right? So a tornado comes through or a winter storm. Yeah, you gotta have food and water and way to stay warm and get a hold of family and be safe and all that. How far you take that is, is a question. But here's the deal. You're not going to, I'm not going to survive the tribulation because I am well prepped. When God releases judgment, mankind cannot stand up. So the warning here is respond to it. Now, you might have noticed there's some good news here. 
throughout each of these judgments, this phrase, a third, is used numerous times. This denotes that there is containment to the devastation for now. It's a big deal. One commentator put it this way. These partial judgments are striking only one third and are meant to warn and to lead a rebellious world to repentance before a final curtain, before the final curtain. For now, God spares more than he smites for now. So because it was contained to a third, that means many more are alive, which means many more can repent, which means many more can come to know Christ. We now live before this tribulation. Many, 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 many more people can give their life to Christ. And God wants to use us to propagate his gospel. So let's respond to his warnings. This plays out in a million different ways. Maybe there's some of you here, and I've been in this season in my life. I'm not judging you. I'm with you. I'm a flawed human being. There's a sin or two or three or four in your life. You know it's wrong. You're convicted about it. The Bible says it's wrong. You agree with the Bible, but you're not doing anything about it. Could be because you're discouraged. Could be because you've given up. I don't know. But I can promise you this. Continuing to sin never is a good idea. It is only going to get worse, not better. So God is warning you. The fact that you know it's wrong, the fact that you feel his conviction, the fact that the word speaks to it, that's his warning. Make the most of his mercy. Respond to his warning now. Save yourself the consequences of living in that sin. Or for others, maybe it's this stubborn self-will. You're going down a path in life and you know the path you're going down is not God's path. You know it in the innards of who you are. And yet you just aren't gonna yield to God. But you know what? God's plan for your life is always gonna be better than any plan that you have for your life. I know you know that's true. So respond to his warnings. His warnings are his loving kindness. Make the most of his mercy. And finally then, be awake. Now hear me, lovingly hear me. If you're sleepy, mildly indifferent, coasting or distracted in your walk with God, it's time to wake up. I think some of the ways that the book of Revelation is used in its intensity and its majesty is to jolt us, to get our intention of what is to yet come, to propel us into action. Now, most of you, if you're really young, maybe this doesn't apply to you, but the rest of us, this applies to you. You've probably been through an experience that fundamentally changes your perspective. It changes your perspective so much that it actually changes how you relate to other people and so on and so forth. I'll give you an example. Some 17 years or so, I was in Kigali, Rwanda, not too long after their horrific genocidal war. And I toured their, their version of a Holocaust museum, their genocide museum in Kigali. And it's, it's morbid and it's, it's, it's a reminder. And the very last station in this museum is called Wasted Lives. It's across the top. And therein lies thousands of little Polaroids of all the children, many of them little children with their siblings, the cutest kids you'd ever see, and the fact that they were all butchered. And then there's these big displays with these beautiful children, and it says how they were killed. And I left there thinking, this, there's no floor to the depravity of man. And that the devil has no mercy. He's going to kill and destroy. And it, it, it is forever marked me and changed me. And I think, in part, Revelation's gift to us is that the intensity of this book is meant to mark us. It's meant to change us. We get the luxury, in some ways, of living in apathy in America because we do have it really good. It's easy to be soft as a Christian. I'm soft as a Christian. I'm sitting in this beautiful auditorium full of heat and light in the front row, and Wonderful people are streaming in, and the doors are open, and there's a draft. And I'm complaining because there's a draft. <laughs> Lord, help me. Now, look, I, I know there's real pain in the world. We have friends, we have loved ones that are going through real suffering and real pain. And I'm not downplaying that, and I'm not saying it's not real. But maybe you would agree with me. In the midst of that very real suffering, at the same time, we're not running for our lives. We're not starving to death. We're not afflicted by every manner of persecution and torment and affliction. We have it really good. 
So let's be awake. For those of you who've given your life to Christ, let's keep him at the center. Let's make him the first love of our life. Let's be ones who graciously, lovingly, and kindly share the very good news of Jesus. For those of you who follow Christ and you, you know, and I'm not judging you, you know in your conscience, you say like, I, I fit in that category of like, I'm kind of lukewarm. Jesus says, be hot or cold, don't be lukewarm. If that's you and you know it, I just encourage you, and, and the word repent is not, in my mind, the word repent is a beautiful word. Sometimes it feels harsh. All that repent means is, instead of pursuing this sin or your own will, turn around and pursue God. Good things come from pursuing God. Get out of the lukewarm zone. And then finally, if you don't know Jesus, maybe it's your first time somebody reading Revelation to you, and it's overwhelming. Maybe this is your day. Maybe this is your day when you realize, goodness gracious, I know I'm not perfect. I know I've sinned. This passage makes it really clear that God is a just God, a perfect God, and a holy God, and I am not in right standing with that God. And I want to be. Well, the great news is, Today could be your day. So in a moment, I'm going to pray, and I would encourage you to pray with me and to give your life to Christ, to get off whatever path you're on and to get on the path that leads to life, and that is Jesus Christ. So church, as we close, be prayerful, be warned, and let's be awake. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. It allows us to know who you are. It allows us to know what's right and wrong. It allows us to know what you want from us and how you want to lead us. God, cause, as we go through the book of Revelation, cause us to be awake to you in a fresh way. Cause us to get out of apathy if that's where we're at. Cause us to get out of lukewarmness. God, for those who are walking closely with you, inspire us afresh into intercession. Inspire us to pull our brothers and sisters into a place of fervency of faith. And for anybody who doesn't know Jesus today, pray this prayer in your heart to God. Jesus, I know I'm imperfect and I know because of my sin, I'm separated from a perfect and holy God. And I learned today that Jesus, perfect God himself, creator of all things, died in my place to pay the debt of my sin. So I don't know all that that looks like today, God, but I give my life to you, Jesus. Please forgive me. Please receive me and teach me what it looks like to follow you all the days of my life. Church, let's take a step forward this year. Let's pray. Let's make the most of God's mercy. And let's be alive to God in every way. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Remember that at one time you Gentiles were separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, from whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. In the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, human cunning, and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, that according to the power at work within us, in him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. 
So ladies, you're all invited to gather. It's February 2nd and 3rd. It's just a few weeks away, and the theme this year is ecclesia. It's a Greek word that means gathering, assembly. And for the first time, Pastor Troy is going to be the speaker at Gather this year. I'm very excited for the ladies to come together and, and be called to come together to be gathered as Christ Jesus has allowed us to be. So for what to expect to gather, if you want to know more about that, you'll want to listen to the podcast that is called She is Becoming. It's going to be released tomorrow, and Pastor Troy and his wife Sherry are going to be a part of that podcast. So you can get your tickets today for the gather coming up February 2nd and 3rd. And uh, so tickets and the link to the podcast that I mentioned that's going to be released tomorrow are both available on our Connect page. And guys, remember this weekend is the vertical endeavor. So if you want that experience with Jesus Christ, if you're like, I've got, got the framework, I've got, got the belief, but I don't know if I've ever met him. Come and meet with us this Friday and Saturday, guys, ladies, at the gather in February and see what God will do. If you've come ready to give, you can do that today. You can do it on the app. You can do it on the Connect page or in person at our giving stations that are here in the church building. And if you want to pray with somebody, you can always go on the app. You can go online through the Connect page and you can leave a prayer request anytime, any day. Or even if you're here today, uh, the ushers would love to show you where the prayer resource center is and, and someone would like to pray with you. Let's pray together before we're dismissed. So, Lord, I thank you that you have met with us today, that we've been able to gather together in your name. And even as we scatter from here, as we go from here, Lord, we don't want to go from you. We want to go with you. You are still our God. Emmanuel. Thank you. May we walk in that hope. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Mm-hmm.